Now that we have had a chance to look at the importance of biodiversity, we now turn to looking at ways that we can actually protect biodiversity. In this lecture, we will be focusing on the Endangered Species Act, how it works, and some ways to improve it. We will also be examining some of the international rules that apply to the protection of biodiversity. We have gradually become aware of our damage to biological resources and of reasons for conserving them. Slowly, we are adopting national legislation and international treaties to protect these irreplaceable assets. Parks, wildlife refuges, natural preserves, zoos, and restoration programs have been established to protect nature and rebuild depleted populations. There have been encouraging progress in this area, but much remains to be done. In this section, we examine legal protections for species in the United States. But keep in mind that this is only a small part of species protection measures worldwide. Most countries now have laws protecting endangered species, though many laws remain unenforced, and dozens of international treaties aim to reduce the decline of biodiversity worldwide. In 1874, a bill was introduced in the U.S. Congress to protect the American bison, whose numbers were falling dramatically. This initiative failed, partly because most legislatures could not imagine that wildlife that was so abundant and prolific could ever be depleted by human activity. By the end of the 19th century, bison numbers had plunged from some 60 million to only a few hundred animals. By the 1890s, though, most states had enacted some fishing and hunting restrictions. The general idea behind these laws was to conserve the resource for future use rather than to preserve wildlife for its own sake. The wildlife regulations and refuges established since that time have been remarkably successful for many species. A hundred years ago, there were an estimated half a million white-tailed deer in the United States. Now there are some 14 million more in some places than the environment can support. Wild turkeys and wood ducks were nearly gone 50 years ago. By restoring habitat, planting food crops, transplanting breeding stock, building shelters or hoses, protecting these birds during breeding season and other conservation measures, we have restored populations of these beautiful and iconic birds to several million each. <clears throat> The Endangered Species Act of 1973 was signed on December 28, 1973, and provides for the conservation of species that are endangered or threatened throughout all or a significant portion of their range, and the conservation of the ecosystems on which they depend. The ESA replaced the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1969. Approximately 2,270 species are listed as endangered or threatened under the ESA. Of these species, about 650 are foreign species found only in areas outside of the United States and our waters. So what does the Endangered Species Act actually do? This act actually protects both the species and the habitat in which it lives. The first thing this act does is provide ways to identify which species are at risk and then provides directions on how to create recovery plans. It provides assistance to landowners to help them participate and the protection of species. And lastly, it does provide enforcement mechanisms for both of the species and the species habitat. The act identifies three degrees of risk. Endangered species are those considered in imminent danger of extinction. Threatened species are likely to become endangered, at least locally, within the foreseeable future. Vulnerable species are naturally rare or have been locally depleted by human activities to a level that puts them at risk. Vulnerable species are often candidates for future listing as endangered species. For vertebrates, a protected subspecies or a local race of ecotype can be listed, as well as an entire species. Worldwide, the International Union of Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, IUCN, lists 17,741 endangered and threatened species, including nearly one-fifth of mammals, nearly one-third of amphibians, reptiles, and fish, and most 
of the few mosses and flowering plants that have been evaluated. IUCN has no direct jurisdiction for slowing the loss of these species. Within the United States, the ESA provides mechanisms for reducing species loss. <clears throat> Once a species is listed, the Fish and Wildlife Service, FWS, is given the task of preparing a recovery plan. This plan details how populations will be stabilized or rebuilt to, to, to sustainable levels. A recovery plan could include many different kinds of strategies, such as buying habitat areas, <clears throat> restoring habitat, reintroducing a species to its historic ranges, captive breeding programs, and plans for negotiating the needs of a species and the people who live in an area. The FWS can then help landowners prepare habitat conservation plans. These plans are specific management approaches that identify steps to conserve particular species of critical habitat. For example, the red cockaded woodpecker is an endangered species that preys on insects in damaged pine forests from North Carolina to Texas. Few suitable forests remain on public lands, so much of the remaining population occurs on privately owned lands that are actively managed for timber production. The ESA uses very specific terminology to describe the species in an ecosystem. Keystone species are those with major effects on ecological function and whose elimination would affect many other members of the biological community. Examples are prairie dogs and bison. Indicator species are those tied to specific biotic communities or successional stages or environmental conditions. They can be reliably found under certain conditions but not others. An example is brook trout. Umbrella species require large blocks of relatively undisturbed habitat to maintain viable populations. Saving this habitat also benefits other species. Examples of umbrella species are the northern spotted owl, <coughs> tiger, and gray wolf. Flagship species are essentially, especially interesting or attractive organisms to which people react emotionally. These species can motivate the public to preserve biodiversity. The Endangered Species Act seeks to restore populations of species such as the bighorn sheep, which has been listed as endangered in much of its range. Charismatic species are easier to get listed than obscure ones. A number of provisions protect landowners as incentives to participate in developing habitat conservation plans. For example, permits can be issued to protect landowners from liability if a listed species is accidentally harmed during normal land use activities. In a, con a candidate conservation agreement, the Fish and Wildlife Service helps landowners reduce threats to a species in an effort to avoid listing it at all. A safe harbor agreement is a promise that if landowners voluntarily implement conservation measures, the Fish and Wildlife Service will not require additional actions that could limit future management options. For example, suppose a landowner's efforts to improve red coquetted woodpecker habitat lead to a population increases. A safe harbor agreement ensures that the landowners would not be required to do further management for additional woodpeckers attracted to the improved habitat. The ESA has held off the extinction of hundreds of species. Some have recovered and been delisted, including the brown pelican, the peregrine falcon, and the bald eagle, which was delisted in 2007. In 1967, before the ESA was passed, only about 800 bald eagles remained in the contiguous United States. DDT poisoning, which prevented the hatching of young eagles, was the main cause. By 1994, after the banning of DDT, the population rebounded to 8,000 birds. By 2007, the population was up to about 20,000, enough to ensure a stable breeding population. Similarly, peregrine falcons, which had been down to 39 breeding pairs, in the 1970s had rebounded to 1,650 pairs by 1999 when we were taken off the list. <clears throat> the American alligator was listed as endangered in 1967 because hunting and habitat destruction had reduced populations to precarious levels. Protection has been so effective that the species is now plentiful throughout its entire southern range. Florida alone may have a population of 1 million or more. An important test of the ESA occurred in 1978 in Tennessee, 
when construction of the Talico Dam threatened the tiny fish called the Snail Daughter. The powerful Tennessee Valley Authority, which was building the dam, convinced the Supreme Court that the dam was more important than the fish. Another important debate over the economics of endangered species protection has been <clears throat> that of the northern spotted owl. Preserving this owl requires the conservation of expansive, undisturbed areas of old-growth temperate rainforest in the Pacific Northwest, where old-growth timber is extremely valuable and increasingly scarce. Timber industry economists calculated the cost of conserving a population of 1,600 to 2,400 owls at $33 billion. Ecologists countered that this number was highly inflated and that forest conservation would preserve countless other species and ecosystem services whose values are almost impossible to calculate. Endangered species often serve as a barometer for the health of an entire ecosystem and as surrogate protector for a myriad of less well-known creatures. However, the Endangered Species Act is often a target of people who believe that the protection of species interferes with their right to use resources for their own intent. While the ESA seeks to balance the needs of species protection and prudent land use, it is often misunderstood. In the past 25 years or so, many countries have recognized the importance of legal protection for endangered species. Rules for listing and protecting endangered species are established by Canada's Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada of 19, 1977, the European Union's Bird Directive 1979 and Habitat Directive 1991, and Australia's Endangered Species Protecting Act 1992. International agreements have also been developed, including the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1992. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, of 1975, provides a critical conservation strategy by blocking the international sale of wildlife and their parts. The Convention makes it illegal to export or import elephant ivory, rhino horns, tiger skins, or live endangered birds, lizards, fish, and orchids. CITES enforcement has been far from perfect. Smugglers hide live animals in their clothing and luggage. The volume of international shipping makes it impossible to inspect transport containers and ships, and documents may be falsified. <clears throat> By concentrating on individual species, we spend millions of dollars to breed plants or animals in captivity that have no natural habitat where they can be released. While flagship species such as mountain gorillas and Indian tigers are reproducing well in zoos and wild animal parks, the ecosystems that they formerly inhabited have largely disappeared. In other cases, <clears throat> land set aside for natural resource and endangered species protection is not the land that contains the greatest amount of biodiversity. In this Hawaiian island, we can see that the location of endangered species is quite separate from the preserves. This is why it's critical to obtain landowner assistance in the protection of endangered species. Conservation biologist R. E. Grumbine has reviewed laws such as the Endangered Species Act and is noted that the best approach to protecting biodiversity <clears throat> has to be performed over long periods of time and on a large scale. His approach includes protecting a sufficient size of habitat so that it is viable for all of the native species in a given region managing resources on a large scale <clears throat> so that natural disturbances will not endanger the entire protected species. He recommends that we plan over comparative centuries so that both the species and its ecosystem can evolve. And lastly, his approach allows for human use and occupancy <clears throat> in ways that do not result in significant ecological degradation. In this chapter, we learned about the various biomes, both terrestrial, marine, and freshwater. Biodiversity can be understood in terms of the environmental conditions where different organisms live, in terms of biomes, and in terms of habitat type. We learned about the concept of biodiversity and noted that it is important to protect biodiversity for aesthetic reasons, but also because biodiversity may provide for improved food and medicine and can stabilize ecosystems. We learned that one of the greatest threats to biodiversity is human beings. 
Over the past 150 years, humans have become the dominant cause of biodiversity and species loss. The acronym HIPPO is a way to understand how humans impact biodiversity. Lastly, we learned about ways that we can protect biodiversity by managing natural resources intelligently.